All right, everyone, welcome again to course six in mathematical modeling with MATLAB. This time, fasten your seatbelts, MATLAB and math in art. First, we'll start with the theory about art, about mathematics, and how they intertwine, because Intuitively, usually, everybody would think that math and art are two things that do not go well together, which is, of course, wrong. Math and art and spirituality, actually, have gone well together for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. Maybe it is about 250 years ago when the separation between the natural sciences and math and the sciences of the mind were separated through the foundation of modern science and the foundation of modern modern art science and art history. So you remember from the last session that images of course are models because images are not the thing they depict. They are not real in that they are not what they show to be, but they are real in being pictures, of course. Uh, reality of pictures is a very, very long, complicated theme, but maybe you have seen a, a scary movie or something, or an interesting new movie or a detective movie that really upset you, and although you knew it wasn't real, the pictures changed you or your emotional state. So. In that pictures are picture and are being viewed, they are, in fact, real. But that doesn't mean when you see somebody, somebody being murdered on TV that you have to call the police. Images are models, and I've shown you last time René Magritte's um, painting La Trahison des Images. That means the traitor's images, or the lying images, or the betraying images. And this image say, uh, shows you um, a pipe, and down below it it says "Ceci n'est pas une pipe," which means this is not a pipe. And as I said, it isn't, of course. It is a painting of a pipe, and you cannot smoke with that one. Yet, it is a painting of a pipe. The same way you could not eat a photo of a pizza. But this is the nature of the model. If you see uh, an image like that for in front of a shop. You would, you would be able to see, okay, inside the shop you could buy a real pipe. So in this, the image of the pipe is of course real and gives you vital or important information. And the same goes with mathematical models. If you make a mathematical model of a predator-prey system, it is not real. There are no sheep and there are no wolves. But maybe um, the model, if modeled correctly, can reflect some part of what the real system does. And this is the nature of the model. Mind the nature of the model. Because do not trust them. Numbers are liars. Numbers can betray you. Numbers can mislead you horribly. So always make sure you take models as models, as they are. They can still help you if you keep that in mind. What's art? Uh, just to in the beginning, let me say something. There is no straight answer to that. There is an answer to what is the liver or what is a heart. There is no answer, no definitive answer um, of the question what art is. And if you ask professors and specialists in art theory or art history, they will probably tell you the same I told you, or they will have a definition which in itself is usually right in their field, but if you ask three specialists about art, they, you will get three different answers per person. So there is not a very easy way to describe art. The ancient Greek had a wonderful word, a word which is called techne, and it was used to describe crafts like if you're making a table, if you're a craftsman, a handyman, a uh, carpenter, or uh, anything like that, or a cook, 
That's craft, that is techne. Techne means the ability of doing something. It was also describing priesthood, because the priests had, of course, an ability to talk to the gods and interpret their will, which was an important part of the Greek, Greek societies. The Greeks, for quite some time, did not believe in their gods. They knew of their gods. So, priesthood was an important thing. And the third one was what we would call art today. It was painting, making music, singing, dancing, and things like that. Plato did describe several levels of art, and what we call art now is the lowest and worst level, because um, a painting of a grape could be photorealistic, but still, if you see the grape, you still don't have a grape to eat, and you can't make wine out of a, a pa um, painting of a grape. So it is actually the lowest form, according to Plato, of art. Still, Techné describes something that is similar to what we now understand as art. Techné, by the way, is the origin of the word technology, so actually engineering and being artists was not so, uh, so different. Uh, technology and art was, I mean, they did not purely, not, not sharply differentiate between those uh, interpretations. Anyway, the craftsman, according to Plato, is more important than a painter, because if you need a sword, it's better than to have someone who can make a sword, and it's useless if war is coming to have somebody who could paint nice swords. Anyway, this is how it is. Some examples. Joseph Boyce said, everybody can be an artist, which does not mean that everybody is an artist. It means that everything and everyday actions, everyday things can be considered arts. Um, maybe you know about Marcel Duchamp, an artist, I don't know if he is an artist, but uh, some consider him an artist who did many very interesting things and he bought some urinals from, or he, I don't know if he bought or borrowed or stole them. Anyway, he had some urinals, the thing men pee in, in, uh, in, in toilets, um, and he signed them and put them on a pedestal. And this was his artwork, although he never called it art, as far as I know. So, every body can be an artist and everything can be maybe seen as art. Martin Heidegger has a, an art definition that I like better. He said in many books, art is what lives inside a piece of work which shows the essence of an object. And I ask you to, to mind that this is a very, very, very short summary. Usually, actually, what he said is inside a whole book. So don't, um, don't cite this as, a, um, as an actual citation by Martin Heidegger, but I don't have room or time to read the whole book with you. What he meant is that art makes clear what is inside something. It is what is the nature of something, according to him. According to him, a good piece of art really does not only show you what something looks like, or maybe doesn't even attempt to show you what something looks like. Art shows you what it is, what is the soul of it, it's the nature, what it is, what it stands for. This painting is wonderful, and Van Gogh was really uh, exhilarated about it because it did not only show a pair of shoes. He thought it was um, farmer's boots. They weren't, but that doesn't matter. Um, he, he thought it shows the nature of the boot, the hard work, the sun and the soil, the dirt, and what it meant to be a Netherlands farmer at that time. This is why he liked this painting so much, and this is what he saw as being art. Max Benze, by the way, this is important for us now, mathematical modeling with MATLAB, is he said something like, artwork is an organized series of symbols which are to be communicated. 
The problem with that is that you could, um, could see every YouTube video as art. But if everything can be art, this also can be right. So you see, uh, the art definition, definition of the word art is horribly difficult. And if people fight about art, it's usually that they have different positions uh, that do not go so well with, it, with each other. But I would say it is hard to say one person is right and the other isn't. What is math? Ooh, that's a tough one. I, I don't know a definition of math that really goes everywhere and says everything about math. There is an US-American mathematician, Douglas Hofstetter, who wrote a book, Gödel Escherbach, which is excellent and which really shows you extremely well what he sees as being math. I would say there's an easy, easier definition I would now accept and say math is a human-made logical system which can be traced back to ancient Greek logic. Ancient Greeks thought, okay, if one thing is true and the other thing is true, both are true, both together are true too, which is the fundamentals of what we now call math, which also, by the way, is fundamental to what we now call digital te technology. Math is a resource and a tool for natural sciences. So those of you who like natural sciences or want to uh, go deeper into it, will most definitely need to know math. It is situated in its own universe. To clarify, in my opinion, math is not a natural science. Because in order to something to be a natural sciences, uh, science, it has to be, well, dealing with nature. This is why physics are natural science, of course. Because uh, physics deal with natural phenomena. Chemistry is natural science. Atomic theory is natural science because atoms are natural. As weird as this may sound, but math, well, math sometimes describes things, yeah, and a nuclear power plant uh, contains natural resources. And that is the point. But in order to be a natural science, something that a science has to be dealing with uh, nature and math not necessarily does that. There are natural sciences who use math, but there is math that has, as far as I know, nothing to do with reality. This is why I introduced, again, with the model idea, a model of a natural system is not a natural system. It is a reflection, maybe, or a shadow of it. By the way, maybe you know the Plato's cave philosophy, he thought that humans live in a world where they are bound in a cave. And between the humans, the humans, there is a, um, before the humans, there is a wall. Behind the humans, there's a great fire burning, shining light from their backs onto the wall. And between the fire and the humans, the gods walk past by and hold up real things, animals, the world, whatever there is. But all humans can see are shadows of those things the gods carry by. And this is why maybe, maybe we cannot see the world in its complexity and in its entirety ever. So Plato is one of the philosophers who made one of the first models ever and I think he's right. Many great artists have dealt with mass, math and art. Of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Can I see them? Yeah. This in the middle here is Leonardo. This is Raphael, Michelangelo, and Donatello. Um, their names are actually Leonardo di Ser Piero da Vinci. Um, he was one of, the, uh, one of the most important artists of the Renaissance, I would say. Then there is Raphael, Raphael da Urbino. Donatello was an ar uh, architect and Michelangelo uh, was a sculptorist and a painter. Now, well, let's start with uh, Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci used math to teach art. 
There is a book that still exists, that is, uh, you can buy, by uh, Leonardo, by, of course, revised and translated by um, other authors, where Leonardo describes how to paint correctly, how the ratios of sizes need be if you want to paint a person, a man, or a woman, or a tree. You have to watch the ratios so they can become natural. And also, Da Vinci knew that, which he um, illustrated in the Vitruvian Man, um, a sketch in inspired by Vitruv, who founded, um, who was one of the uh, arch architecture theorists, who was important to, um, well, to, to find relationships and ratios between natural things. And he made a sketch of that, proving that um, Vitruv was wrong because Vitruv believed that a perfect human body would fit both inside a holy circle and inside a Platonian um, rectangle. And if you watch, if you look at the um, scribble of the Vitruvian man, you can see that Da Vinci showed that this, this is simply not true. Anyway, the connection between math and art can also be seen in another Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Raphael. Raphael da Urbino painted the painting, The School of Athens, which can be seen in uh, the Vatican today, it still exists. And he is depicting Pythagoras' Tetractis, and it is a philosophy of divine harmony, which is based upon numbers, interestingly. This, um, it is a very big fresco, it's painted on a wall on still wet um, plaster. And in one corner, he um, cites Pythagoras, you can prove that this is uh, Pythagoras. And um, on, the, on a little, little um, plate, it says, uh, it shows one of the uh, harmonic theories of um, Pythagoras, which is called Epochton. So, in art, there is actually um, a uh, reference to a mathematical philosophy that is a reference to divine, to notions of divine harmony. You need to know, if you want to um, read something very interesting and exhilarating, you don't need to read the Da Vinci Code. Actually, study something about art history that's far more interesting. And <laughs> uh, they find out things that are true and still Hardly believable. Anyway, Yapason, I will not torture you with that. Um, it um, gives you ratios which are considered uh, holy by um, Pythagoras and his disciples, which interestingly are found in music theory again, because the, the ratio of 1 to 2 means an octave. In music theory, octave means where is is the place where a new uh, harmonic line begins. And um, there are others which I will um, which I will skip now. Anyway, uh, nowadays there are mathematicians and artists who still work with art a lot. This painting is by Martina Schettina, an Austrian painter who happens to be a teacher, professor for math and physics, which does make sense in that, well, she can really present beauty in mathematical systems to people who do not necessarily know about math. This beautiful painting says a lot. It is a depiction of the Penrose parquet, the Penrose tiling. The question was, the question of the Penrose tiling was, how to completely fill an infinite plane with shapes, with two different shapes, while no translatory symmetry may occur. That means you have an internal field that goes on forever. And you have only two different shapes to fill it completely uh, without any translatory repetition. This is very, very interesting. And she depicted it in this painting. Penrose, Roger Penrose, is a mathematician who still lives, and he found it, the Penrose tiling, and it does fulfill these requirements. Two slightly different rhombical shapes are used to com in com combination, in various combinations, to 
make this infinite tiling with only five-step rotatory and mirror uh, symmetries, but no translatory symmetries. Can, maybe, maybe you can see how great this is. And Martina Shettina really, um, she nailed it. She really painted this painting in a way so you can see how beautiful this is, how beautiful uh, the rotation is, how different the shapes are, and with the uh, shapes not yet put in, um, into the um, growing uh, eternal shape, um, she kind of, at least that is what I see in it, she kind of tells you that there is infinite work to be done. And the nice thing about it is, it is a, a beautiful painting of this ingenious design, and it shows how the tiling works. You can almost move the tiles on your own and complete this infinite piece of work. And the fun thing is, the idea came to her when she was flying home over her home country, Lower Austria, and when she saw the beautiful shapes and colors of her home's farmlands, of the farm that change in color, depending on what is grown there, she thought of this painting and of this interestingly ingenious mathematical structure. By the way, the painting is held in blue and yellow, which are Lower Austria's banner colors. So here you can see uh, that Martina Schettina uses art as, teach, as a method of teaching math. And you can look at her other works, they're quite ingenious. One thing that quite nicely corresponds uh, to Martina Schettina's work is what I think, uh, what I have done in, for several, re, uh, several years. What, I'm, what I try to do is make paintings from math. I don't paint math. I use math that paints. And as you may have figured out already, I use MATLAB with that. So there is inherent beauty in math. Not everyone can see that, but I, um, it is important to me to show you that math is not always pain or boring. Math can be quite beautiful. So we can use scripts and use mathematical terms to create structures. You know that a sine wave is something that goes up and down, up and down, forever. And you can, you can transform this change to colors. You can say it's brighter, dark, or brighter, dark, brighter, dark. Minus, of course, can make things darker or brighter. And logarithm does what a logarithm does. Just Keeping in mind the idea that Pythagoras and colleagues believed that numbers de depict the will and the harmony of the gods, you can easily see that, of course, numbers can depict colors, which is why I, uh, last time I showed you how to image process, because numbers, of course, can be colors, like in dig digital imagery, and also numbers can be beautiful in or as colors. There are many difficult, uh, different, um, different paintings you can take a look at if you want. One thing I want to say, show you, um, tell you before I start writing a small script which will help you with the exercises. Um, what I try to do uh, is depict the beauty of mathematical terms using MATLAB. And for that, mathematical terms like sine, cosine, exponential functions, and logarithm, and so on, are allowed. What is not allowed are fractals, fractal structures, or chaotic systems. What's not allowed also are random values, or anything that is not predictable. I want to show you the chaos and harmony in math without systems or parts that are inherently chaotic or random. Okay, last time we had the idea to make pictures with MATLAB, which is 
important if you want to go into video processing or image processing and work with that. You must understand that digital image processing is always matrix calculations. And even if you use a, a program like Photoshop or Premiere or whatever you use, it is always crunching numbers. So, if I want to make um, a painting, a math-like painting, I can use the color map, the color map structure I showed you last time. So, I'm making a color map. Which means you create a matrix that contains uh, three columns, each column representing one color channel, like red, green, and blue, while each row contains the whole color. So, let's start. Let's call the color map color map equals a matrix that contains RGB values. In order to create a um, colorful color map, you should create, well, not just single colors, but maybe you create them using math again. So let's use sine and cosine values to make different colors. So the t vector is the time vector. t equals 1 in steps of 0 0.05 in steps of uh, up until 4 times pi. So we said we are using um, sine values. Uh, so since the sine, the period in the sine wave re um, restarts uh, after 2 pi, we can see here now that we have two periods. We have to transpose it in order to make the t vector a column vector. So let's say the color map down here has three channels. Let's call it, well, let's call the red channel sine of t. We have now one problem. Uh, the color channels in a color map may only have values between 0 and 1. And as you may know, sine is always between minus 1 and 1. So add 1. Now, the sine wave here is between 0 and 2. We want to have it between 0 and 1, so divide the whole thing with by, by 2. Let's mark this comment. Always comment when you do MATLAB um, scripts. This is the time vector for the sine wave uh, for the color map. This is the color map, obviously. This is the R channel, which means red. So the second channel is green. Let's call it cosine, but just do it the same way here. Cosine is also between minus 1 and 1, so it has to be scaled to be between 0 and 1. So cosine of t plus 1 divided by 2. And the blue channel, let's make another sine wave, but shift it a little sine of t plus pi half. Do it exactly the same anyway. Plus 1 divided by 2. Close it. So we have a color map. This color map um, will be used to make the um, to make the image. Now we have to create an image matrix. Call it image. Ones of a hundred. What this does now, it is a um, plain image that only has one color because it only uh, it only um, accesses the first element of the color map matrix. So this would probably be pretty boring. So let's make another one. Image equals. Now, we have to have different values 
in that. So I can tell you that the, tie, the T vector is 252 elements long, so the color map contains 252 colors. So I'll make a vector, a transposed vector, that goes from 1 to square root of 250. Let's do it, take it that way. I will explain why and how I do that. Times 1, 2, square root of 250. What this does now is the following. This is um, a column vector here times a row vector. Usually mathematicians would say this cannot work, this is not possible, but in fact it does here because in this in this case every element uh, with every vector is um, multiplied and it creates a matrix. So let's delete the upper one and check out what it does. So I have saved this script under colormaptest.m and I'm just now executing it. First of all, maybe clear all, close all, just to be sure. Usually I do this, that in the script. I do it now here in the command window so you um, can see that I do it. Okay, I'm executing color map test. It has calculated an image and a color map. The image is numbers between 1 and 225. The color map contains a matrix of three columns and each row in the matrix is one color. So to display this image I made now, I use I am show. I am show image and I provide the color map. And that's how it's done. It's very small, it doesn't do much, but this is how you can make images using MATLAB. Thank you very much.